So I'm going to jump into this and, and yes, this deck will be available. Yes, we'll make the recording available as well too. So do not stress, we'll have both of these things as a part of this. Um, and like I said, I've got the chat pulled up here and here for comments. So if you're on LinkedIn, you have a question, Jake, I hate playbooks, whatever it might be, let me know. I'll try to give you my hot take on it. So first and foremost, Let's talk a little bit about scaling um, and what goes into that. Well, actually, first and foremost, let's talk a little bit about scaled. It's interesting. A lot of people, I really think this, they think that my full time job is just posting content on LinkedIn. That is not the case. I run a 40 plus person consulting firm. We have offices globally and we really help organizations to optimize their processes and technology stack below that. So, you know, I get a chance every single year to talk to hundreds of sales leaders, CEOs, I get a chance to see their playbooks, uh, what they're doing for outbound sales, account management, etc. And so what we're going to walk through today is really, you know, and, and I was actually on with the CRO earlier today. And he asked me about, hey, Jake, what's new? What's interesting? What are you seeing? What's different? He's like, I'm 50 something years old. Like, what's different today? Um, another sales leader's like, I feel like a dinosaur. Um, but I know that I need to get up to speed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about like these key topics. So where leadership goes wrong, why do it? Because a lot of people, a lot of people, honestly, it sounds like a good idea or VC might tell you like, yeah, you need to build a playbook. Um, yeah, but maybe you just need like a really light V1. And then I'm going to walk through where to start. So if I were sitting in your shoes, what would I do today to either build out a playbook from scratch or potentially overhaul the playbook that I already have? Uh, and then obviously, like I said, Q and A will be doing throughout. So if I see questions pop up, I'll, I'll hop in. All right, so where early stage leadership goes wrong. Um, the number one issue that we see around playbooks and, and by the way, you know, we're calling this early stage, but I have to tell you all that um, I see the exact same thing in larger companies as well too. It's not just a, um, you know, and feel free, give a thumbs up if you're on LinkedIn, or uh, I think you can do reactions now on uh, Zoom. Um, if you feel this, that, you know, even if you are at a bigger company, many times the onboarding process or the process for getting people up to speed um, is also very similar. Like, and I make this analogy all the time that imagine building software. If you're like, okay, we need to build software. Okay, what do we need? We need software engineers, right? It's the same thing. Hey, we need to grow revenue. What do we need? Salespeople. Okay. Would you ever hire a software engineer? Ever, 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 ever hire a software engineer and say, oh, wait, oh, wait, you've, you've done some coding before? And then like a three hour interview where you never actually test if they can code. Okay, well, think about this, think about this. And say, oh, you know C++? Amazing. Here's our code base. Just start coding. No, that's insane. You go talk to a VP of engineering or CIO, they'd be like, are you insane? That's going to turn out to be terrible. Well, guess what? It's the same thing for your sales process. So you have to realize most sales individuals are used to executing and not building. So when a founder, a first time VP, or even if you're more established in a new territory, you think that salespeople are gonna magically figure it out. It's not, it's not their fault. It's not that they're bad or stupid because they can't figure it out. It's that any job that if you want it done well has guardrails, right? So again, to me, this is, I think one of the, the kind of the, the punchline is 22% of startup founders have a background in sales. So what does that mean? They're out there, they're doing their thing. They've got their own way of doing it. And then you, sometimes you even document it and you want people to sell the way that you sell. You're a founder. The amount of conversations I have to have with founders where I'm like, look, the best you're ever going to get is someone who's 80% as good as you. <laughs> 80%, right? And if we get there, like we're doing fantastic. And also a founder can talk about their vision and their strategy and all this. But a new sales rep or even your first VP, they can't really talk about that, right? So, so if you're out there and you're, you're wondering why it's not working, right? And then again, kind of couple that with this 50, so 50% of founders have had previous startup, 
22% have had have a background in sales, you can easily see why it is difficult for companies early on to build out their first playbook. And the interesting part about this stat, this stat is focused on very much the founders. It's also the same as a sales leader. Very few sales leaders have had to build from scratch a playbook. And so again, they are also used to executing. Now, for me, I'll tell you a little bit about my experience. So I was in sales for two and a half years in sports, uh, left to, to go to career builder. At career builder, I learned a process. I got, well, one, I you know, moved to leadership quickly, got put through leadership development, and I learned the, 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 the science of sales. And so I had a very regimented, dictated process that helped to make my team some of the top performing teams in the company. And then when I went to a startup, Glassdoor, I was able to pick up my process and execute it. A lot of sales leaders at bigger companies just kind of go through things with like being, what is it, unconsciously competent is, the, I think, the, the vernacular. So for anyone out there, I want you to just think about that, that, um, you know, it's not that you're like, it's not like it's impossible to do, but many times um, you're just not qualified to do it. And that's okay. That's fine. Right. But again, a playbook can help. Again, people want to know why salespeople fail out so early. It's because we don't document the playbook. Okay. Next up, the other reason I see for early stage failing to scale details is I call it the good old, well, do I call it the good old Messiah? I do call it the Messiah hire, which is that what we try to do is we say, you know what we need to do? You know what? So, hey, I know these stats. I'm a founder. I, you know, I've never done this before. So then you say, ah, you know what I'm going to do? Hire a VP of sales. I'm, I'm going to go hire a VP of sales, which by the way, rem remember what I'd said before, most VPs of sales have not built a sales playbook from the ground up. Not that they, or, or they, they just don't have that documented process. Maybe they came from a company that had a really strong sales playbook. So it's fine. Like again, when I went and built my first, I didn't have the, the experience, but I was very regimented in how I thought about the sales process. So it was very easy for me to replicate it. And so that's the things that, you know, when you're thinking about interviewing and why, and take a look at this stat. People ask me, Jake, why did you start your own company? Right? Why did you do this? And it's because of this stat <laughs> that the average tenure of a VP of sales at a startup is, is 16 to 24 months. Like I almost made it to the 24. I almost made it there uh, with my my first my first uh, jump. Um, and and a part of this is just the things that you need change. And so again, when you think about this concept of a playbook right? Which is the way it's a playbook to me is a combination of a couple different topics. It is the process. What are the steps that happen? What are the things that need to happen in between each steps to then move to the next steps, the exit criteria or entry criteria, whatever you want to call it, right? Reports and dashboards so we can optimize the process. And it's also the content. How do I show up in the discovery process? How do I show up uh, whenever I position strategically what we do? How do I show up when I present a proposal or demo or whatever it looks like? So again, where this goes wrong is one, sometimes founders try to do it on their own, or two, we think we can outsource it and we don't know what to do in terms of, and again, just like if you don't know how to write code, that's fine. You don't need to go teach yourself to code, right? You can go find someone who might do that. But again, the, the concept that you're going to hire a, a Messiah, this, this VP of sales, who's going to figure everything out for you is a complete insa insanity, right? You're still going to have to work with that person. You're going to need to help to shepherd them, et cetera. So that's it. So uh, this is a big one for me. So another reason why building enterprise sales playbooks for early and growth stage companies is difficult is a lot of the time we don't spend enough time focusing on who we sell to. This is one of the most important ones. So I'm not experienced as a founder. I'm expecting someone else to do it for me, but I don't even know who my persona is. And I have to tell all of you out there, this is the stuff that I feel like a lot of salespeople, like their eyes glaze over. They're like, well, my buyer personas, my industries. I'm, I'm gonna tell you this right now, that if you dedicate more of your time to learning this, and watching less Netflix, or if you spend more of your time 
training, like again, getting insights. Who is my buyer? What do they care about? In the discovery process, asking questions to go deep. Who are these people? What do they care about, et cetera? When you do that, this is how you are able to have more productive conversations. And this needs to be at the heart of every single playbook. I very, I will never forget. I, I wish I might have it like in some old box, like over here, like in the storage somewhere. I'll never forget for my onboarding at Career Builder, we got a binder. Yes, it was like a physical piece of like a binder that was that thick, right? One, this is two thousand for context. This is 2006. Now the saying is like, you don't print the internet, right? Um, but what they had done is they had put together the top trends in like 15 of the top industries that we sold into. And a big part of our onboarding was understanding those trends at a high level. Because guess what? We had to sell into these different groups and it wasn't easy, right? Later on, that same career builder actually ended up verticalizing because it was hard to stay up to speed on these trends, right? And for a lot of you, it's not that complex. But I am telling you right now, if you want to have a world-class playbook that's going to allow you to close more enterprise deals, the more time that you invest in documenting who your customer is, who these different people in the buying circle are, um, the trends in the industry that these, that these individuals are in, that allows them to have executive conversations, right? Uh, Drew Williams, shouting it out, laid the foundation in 2008. Me too. I would like to say that as well. Shout out to Chris Scarrett as well. Um, you know, Kerber Kr very, was very fortunate. Kerber did have a very strong sales training program and process program. And I think for a lot of people, they drilled this into me. And I was able to, as I build teams and hired hundreds of sales reps now, um, I, this is what I drill into my team. You know, I very specifically remember, you know, when I was a frontline leader and then a director and a VP, my very first question, anytime we talk account strategy, how do they make money? If you don't know how someone in that industry makes money, if you don't know, then the second question is, what does this person actually do? You're sh I'm shocked. I'm, I'm seriously shocked at times. I say, wait, what's this person role? And they tell me a job title. Okay, look, director of operations can mean 9,000 different things. Okay, so, you know, if you don't really know what they do and who's in their, their circle, it's really tough to drive action as well, too. So those are the big things, right, is that we skip over some of the things that go into the buyer persona in the industry. And for all of you who are sales reps out there, or if you're sales leaders, regardless, if you want to know where you can spend time that will pay off in two, three, four X, this is that time, right? Investing and in understanding so I can have a business conversation with somebody versus a tactical product conversation. This is what, this is what pays off. All right, so, so those are some of the pitfalls that I see, right? Founders either try to build the playbook or they expect salespeople to just like figure it out like magic. Two, we expect people to just like, we hire this magical VP of sales and like they're just gonna wave the wand and build out this process even though they've never built it before. And three is the playbook spends little to no time really educating the sales organization on the buyers, right? <clears throat> As a part of this. So, all right, let's talk about the sales playbook, okay? So this is, this is, I think, like the stat, right? Which is like companies that have a defined process and sales playbook grow revenue 18% faster than companies that don't. And again, when you start to think about the numbers, that's quick. And let me, let me tell you this, it, the reason this is, okay? The reason that organizations grow faster, okay? And my guess, gosh, I would guess, you know, this is from 2015. I would guess it's even more now is ramp time. That if you have a documented process, you can teach me quickly what my, what these buyers care about. You can teach me how to, what the customer journey looks like. You can teach me what, ha what, what to do at each step of the process. Then I can just make my own magic happen within, with inside it. Right. And that's what, you know, that's what happened to me is, you know, I'd, I'd started at, at this company and um, <laughs> I, I was very good at sales, but I didn't have a process. And so I was really struggling. I mean, I had a process, but it was more intuitive than that. And, and once I learned the process, man, my results just skyrocketed. Um, if you've heard me talk before, it's, you know, I was the second to last person in my training class to sell anything. And that's when my, my boss had this come to Jesus with me where he said, um, Jake, why aren't you following the process? And why aren't you following the messaging? And I said, well, the process, <laughs> 
sales is about, it's about relationships, right? It's about, it's about getting people to like you and building trust. And he's like, dude, he goes, do you think we train a thousand salespeople on this, this process because we're stupid? And I was like, no, you don't. Uh, that would be, that would be stupid. And then I closed $60,000 in new business the next month, no inbound leads, 60,000 net new from cold outbound. And to me, that's where, that was my first, and that was about, gosh, that would have been 14, 15 years ago now. That was my aha as to like the reality of why this stuff matters, right? <clears throat> and so why do those cho companies choose to rev grow revenue so much faster, right? And, and, and what does that actually mean for you to be able to grow revenue faster? There's a few things. One is consistency, right? There's nothing worse than, you know, think about the best brands in the world. Think about the brands that you might admire. Think about, you know, Soul Cycle, Restoration Hardware, Vogue, uh, you know, these like iconic brands, you know, these things that you think about. And what are they? They're consistent. So somehow they're able to maintain a very high level of, you know, again, less Prada, like you name it, you name a high end brand, even a Supreme, right? It doesn't matter. They are consistent. Doesn't mean they don't, they're not different and they don't do different things but they're consistent. And so the benefits of the playbook for all of you, and again, going back to the question here is like, why do those companies grow revenue so much faster? Well, because they've got an experience and a feel. If not, your team is constantly showing up, like, like how should I show up today? As opposed to like, this is what it is, this is what we do. All those companies I mentioned hire very expensive people, they pay above market for a lot of roles, but they're consistent. And so for you as an individual, as a company, consistency is important. It allows you to come in and execute your day-to-day. -day. When you don't have a process, you're trying to figure it out on the fly. I talk about this all the time, that um, if I don't have the questions documented, I'm thinking about the next question that I need to ask. Our brain is not great at multitasking, no matter what, what, no matter what story we tell ourselves. The brain is actually not that great at it. And so, again, for a lot of you out there, don't mistake consistent for robotic, right? Don't think because it's a consistent process or playbook that you're losing anything. You're gaining freedom to interact within a best-in-class process. Next up, and this kind of feeds into this, right? Is this a consistent experience for your customers and employees? Again, uh, I'll use a Ritz Carlton example here. Natasha on our team loves to talk about Ritz Carlton. When you go to these different locations, they know what these other people do, right? So if you go to one Ritz Carlton to the next, they, you, you will see a consistent experience for the customer, right? And they also know, employees know what other people do. So they know who to loop in at certain points of, like, of uh, you know, uh, issues or to surprise and delight, which Ritz Carlton does fantastically. So again, allowing you to be consistent in how you show up for your customer, it allows you to get a benchmark, which is number three. Without consistency in terms of how the team performs, how we show up for the customer, I can't benchmark anything, right? And for a lot of you out there, you know, think about this concept. How can I benchmark something if I've got 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 different people doing it 100 different ways. How can I ever quantitatively get better versus qualitative of what I think is better? Not that my gut's going to be like terribly off, but just imagine a sales organization that has a documented process that's being measured when people are doing things consistently. I can then say, look, step four is the bottleneck. And just like any good throughput, any good logistics, um, you know, in my, any of my logistics fans out there, um, if, I, if I can identify a system, a controlled system, I can then identify the bottlenecks and I can remove them. And then I see my next controlled system. Up oh, there's the next bottleneck. And so for a lot of individuals out there, like you cannot have true KPIs, okay, as a part of this, if you do not have consistent processes. So, all right, I'm going to cover the, the next two, but I've got a question here. And again, y'all, I've got some time at the end, but feel free to drop, start dropping the questions into the Q&A as well, too. Um, 
it's just it's helpful because then I can grab them when I want to. Um, so I love this. Eli asks, um, this falls under brand strategy. What do you think about a brand officer working with the CRO to build the sales process? Well, here's what I would say. In, in a well-run organization, I think you're going to see more and more companies do this exactly, where they realize that, look, products today, whether no matter how much we want to think we're all special flowers and that we're all different, it all sounds the same. For most organizations, it sounds the same. Let me put, I'm going to give you a prime example of something that we're all living, like two companies that we're living through right now, maybe three, Gong and Chorus. Again, and apologies to any of my Gong or Chorus members out there um, by, by saying this, but the products at a very basic level do very similar things. But if you look at the brand strategy that Gong took, Verse about a brand and an experience and, and who they were and how they interacted, ah, there's no secret that that's why they got valued at $7.5 billion. Similar product, conversational intelligence. Guys, conversational intelligence has been around for a long time. Long time. So if you aren't being conscious about your sales experience, absolutely, Eli, um, you're going to be in trouble. Because if you all sound the same, the processes sound the same, anybody who can give a, a differentiated experience will beat a better product because they all sound the same. So I, I think that it could work and I would love to see it work um, if more people were open to it. So again, keep the questions coming. I love that one. Uh, That's a great one. Andrew, don't mistake consistency with robotic. I was going to steal and, then, and um, I was going to also then add in Ricky, which is don't mistake consistencies with robotic. Instead, it equals iconic, which I thought would have been a good little play there. Um, so, all right, next up, overarching or arching view of the business landscape. This goes back to that industry trends, what people do. Okay, if your playbook does not help your, like, I can't imagine, like, man, if I would have had to go gone and searched for, okay, what is a VP of operations and manufacturing? What is, if I would have had to have gone and searched for all this, it would have taken me for forever to get up to speed on the industry, et cetera. So I could go and have a intelligent conversation with an exec, right? Like it would, I mean, I can't even think about how long it would have taken me if I didn't have the business landscape. And again, this is evolving. And if you, any of you out there, you're like, man, my playbook doesn't have business landscape. Let me tell you where to start. It's called Google and YouTube. Okay. So all you have to do is you would say, Hey, what's going on? You know, here, we're going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to deviate here from the, 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 the initial plan here. Okay. So, oh, oh, wait, the way I shared my screen, I can't do it, but I will come back to this. What I wanted to show you all is like, what happens if I actually just go and Google, you know, what it means to be a VP of sales in XYZ industry. And I think many of you will be absolutely shocked where you're like, oh, well, here it is. Here we go. All right, I figured it out. Right. So you got that. Let's see. Screen two, share. So if you want to know what are industry trends, how about this? 20, 2022 trends in, uh, let's do like industrial, ooh, here's a really exciting industry, industrial manufacturing. Let's say you sell into industrial manufacturing. Huh, that could be interesting, right? So again, for a lot of you out there like this, manufacturing trends from ENY. Five trends, manufacturer value chain, digital twins, whatever, I don't even know what the hell that means. So how many of you out there are doing this or including this type of insights into your playbook? You're doing your team a massive disservice if you're not. Again, like what's the alternative? Like, again, I could literally read this article. Okay, I don't know how reputable this is. Six key manufacturing trends here for 2022. Well, let's take a look, right? Shorter, simpler supply chains. Oh, that makes sense. Shrinking new product development cycles. I could literally read this article and go have a conversation with a VP of operations at an industrial manufacturing company tomorrow, as opposed to what instead, what do we, what do we spend all our playbook focused on? We, we, we don't spend it focused on how to have smarter conversations with the people that buy from us. We, we focus it on med pick and all this other stuff. I would take someone who knows and can talk the industry and trends much, much, much more than someone who's really good at just like qualification of deals, 
Now, if you combine the two, that's a, a, a win-win. So again, any of you can be an expert. Any of you can get up to speed on this at any given time. But again, I do just want you all to think about that, that, you know, it's not that difficult, but it's a critical, critical piece of this um, as a part of like building out a real world class. Okay, uh, critical information for winning investors, right? So again, for me, like this is the KPIs, right? So again, I'm, I'm talking about early growth, venture back. Like for me as a, a playbook, in my playbook, do I have the right KPIs for my team that I can roll up, right? A lot of you out there are probably trying to raise money and that's what it is. Um, next up, again, when I think consistency across the team, what else? What should I be doing? Where do I hand off people to things? What's expectations for my role? What are metrics for my success? Consistency across team. How should I show up to work every day? I cannot tell you how many leaders, one of the big reasons they have friction on their team is they don't, they expect, again, someone to just show up and know it. It's not gonna happen, okay, right? I love this, right? Like 60% of teams, right? Or 60% or more of their total pipeline to actively design and deploy sales plays, right? Why? Because they're proven best practices. And if you have a proven best practice that's documented, I can replicate that, right? Again, we talked about this before, right? 33% more likely to be high performers. So again, consistency is great. It's great. The customer knows how you're going to show up. You know what's expected of you as an employee. It's all great, right? And so for a lot of it, again, when I think about this one in particular, which is that 55% of salespeople don't have the skills they need to be successful, it's a mix of skills and process. Because look, what, what, what a good process can make up for is me gaining skills. So if I'm growing and I'm learning a process that's brand new, a process can help me where, again, I might not know all the skills, I might not have all the answers, right? So for a lot of you out there, just think of that, that, you know, again, if you're out there, you know, do you have a, a way to help to level up your team? The number one way that you can level up your team to, to take into account that 55% is having a playbook, having a process, right? So the, the other thing I'll mention here is around creating a reliable customer and employee experience, right? So what goes into that? Come on. There we go. Um, I'm really shocked at times when, you know, it feels like we focus first on building top of funnel, then it's a sales playbook, and then it's a how we interact with our current customers, right? And so the customer one is like all encompassing, right? So when I think of a customer experience, it's not just when they become a customer, it's from the start, but don't sleep on the CX one in particular, right? And then the flip side is again, the employee, right? Like how do I structure my day-to-day, -day, those types of things. So when I think about this like holistic, consistent experience, Again, have you documented the end-to-end -end experience? And for all of you who are leaders out there, this doesn't take a million years to do. Just to lock yourself in a room for a day and you can probably have an idea of what this looks like. So again, for a lot of you out there, just think about that consistent and then how do I show up on a daily basis, both internally and for my, my people? And that makes a world of difference, right? And again, I think for a lot of organizations, it can, it can be make or break. Like this process, this consistency of experience can be make or break. It can be make or break with your customers, can be make or break with your employees. I cannot tell you how many times I've talked to sales reps and leaders like that place was a nightmare, right? They didn't have anything documented, et cetera. Like they didn't have this, they didn't have this. And then the founder blames the sales reps and the reps blame the company. The, you know, the reality is it's somewhere in between. So again, having this documented, again, a playbook just isn't for investors. A playbook just isn't to say we checked a box. A playbook will help you to retain more business, grow your company, and also keep more people. All right. The benchmark. This is the, this is, this is it. That again, if you don't get establish the benchmark, right, you cannot really truly understand the bottlenecks. What I see when companies, when they don't do this process well up front, instead what happens is they constantly end up solving for symptoms and not problems because their process is not well documented. There's actually like a, a smaller you know, stream coming out of one end of this pipe. And so they go, oh, how can we, how can we widen the end of the pipe or whatever it is, or, 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 or even better, how can we increase more water? Well, guess what? The, the problem is actually in the middle, there's this huge piece of metal that's coming down and blocking the water flow. 
And so if you don't have a process that shows, hey, what does an ideal process look like? You're never going to know like, oh, we, we then check this to see what's working and then this and this and oh, now this is the issue. And so again, for a lot of you out there, really think about this and, and this last point about improving the process that it doesn't stop because then once this goes through, and now it's like, okay, now how do I widen the pipe? Oh, we widen the pipe again. Oh, now this bottleneck happened. It just, it, it happens all the time. So for anyone out there, um, you know, it's just a, a big piece to think. So I got a fantastic question here that I want to take. Again, we're going to go to Q&A here in the next like five minutes. I've uh, just got a couple more slides I'll talk you all through. Um, it says, how much room do you leave for creativity if everything is about consistently consistency, especially for reps that have been given on the team, been on the teal, been on the team for a while and used to having a little bit of wiggle room. This to me is like this. This question is it's from anonymous attendee. So anonymous attendee, thank you, because this is a very, very, very good question. And I'm sure it's candidly, it's the number one question that um, a lot of leaders struggle with. And I think it's, you know, we, it's this, this fine balance um, between the process and the art and the consistency. Here's what I would say. What separates a great lawyer from a good lawyer? What separates a great accountant from a good accountant? What separates a great athlete from a good athlete? I think you already know where I'm going with this. Consistent and disciplined. But, but... When you have those things, when you put in the work and you have a process, look, a million lawyers study the letter of the law, but some know how to read, like they read it and they have the conversations and they're good at being client facing, et cetera. Any accountant knows general accepted accounting principles, but great accountants know how to operate within that framework to optimize spending. So a, a process Again, great athletes know I've got to practice for X number of hours. So then in the game, I don't go in perfectly. I, I, I have the rules, we have the plays, and then I react. But it starts with the base offense. It starts with the base defense. I'm out there to run and to execute plays. You know, and, and I think too often, you know, again, it's like, and too often we, we again, we mistake this idea of having a process as being binding, the reality is it should, it's, it's, it's about disciplining in the process so you know it so intimately that you can operate more freely. The more you practice, the more you dribble, the more that you can do crazy things with, with you know, running the offense. The more that you practice law and you know the letter of the law and the intent and case law and blah, 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 you can, you actually, you're much more free to think, et cetera. So, so again, process and consistency can actually be very freeing. The consistency, again, is about how you show up and that you're not showing up. And it's not that you're not mirror matching or changing that. But again, I want a lot of you to think about that, that if you want to be all time at something, you need to have some type of process around it. And so, again, it's not going to take away from, um, you know, it's not going to take away from that. Let's put it that way. The business landscape, I've talked about this one quite a bit. Um, Man, this is what I used to drill. I used to just drill my teams on these things, and I still do today. Who's our market? Who do we serve? You know, we did a big, big exercise. I remember with our marketing team maybe three months ago, and and I remember with our you know we have a head of marketing who's been here for a while. I was like, look, if we can't drill the buyer personas, we, you know, can never be successful. And we drill the buyer personas, and um, you know that's why we're here today. So for a lot of people out there, is again, if you're not training your teams on these things you're gonna be in a really difficult uh, world, right? And that goes back to, I just got another question here that is, I think, very relevant to this, which is um, B2B, a C-suite people complaining about generic sales questions they get asked uh, that come up with a predictable sales process. How do I go around this? It's the quality of the questions that you ask, right? I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna ask the same question a, a couple different ways. Let's say I'm meeting with a VP of operations of a $250 million company. This person's responsible for operations for that company. I can ask the same question two different ways. And this goes back to, it's the same process and way that I ask questions. But one is, okay, great. Hi, John. Um, tell me about the top priorities for xyz.org. Top priority, dude, what do you mean? Like, we've got a lot, like around what? Like around, what do you mean top priorities? You look stupid. That sounds generic. Okay, same another version. 
Hi, John. And again, we've already been talking. I wouldn't ask this question. You know, it's not the, this isn't the icebreaker. But I'd say, all right, so look, I work with many VPs of operations right now. Right now, I know in industrial manufacturing, um, there's a lot of trends around simplifying supply chain, around you know, eliminating the, the bottlenecks in, in supply chain and having less vendors and other details. What are your top two priorities to improve operational efficiency at XYZ? Same question, just easier to answer. Because guess what? When I said top priorities, I actually meant what I said the second time. So a lot of times the reason that the C-suite complains is that people's questions suck. The, question, the quality of the question you ask determines the quality of answer that you receive. Facts, right? And so for a lot of you, if you wonder why your questions aren't landing, and by the way, I went through this myself when I was like 26. I very specifically, like, man, these, these VPs of HR are like not, they always keep kicking me down. And then I realized I'm like, oh my God, my question, you know, like I would listen to myself and it was, and I, would, I would hear the reaction to my question. And I could almost hear the eye roll in the phone. I'm like, yeah, so, or what would happen after I asked three questions is they would go, yeah, can you, look, I totally get it. Can you just tell me more about what you do? And every time that would happen, I'd re-engineer of like, what did I just ask or say that led to this outcome? So to me, if you want to know a trend of why C-suite people are complaining about generic questions, it's because the questions are generic and they're sloppy. And again, I don't need to know everything about everything. I literally just Googled <laughs> trends in industrial manufacturing. I could now, I'm pretty confident, I could pull that article up and I could have an intelligent business conversation with the VP of ops because I would just say, hey, these are the top two or three trends that we're seeing. What are, what, which of these are a top priority for you all? Or is there something different? What does that do that shows, wow, this guy gets it. He's done his research, et cetera. So anyway, I will not, you know, build that over and over again, right? Again, and I, the last thing I'll tell you is like, as you scale, this is what investors are gonna need to see to have, to write a big check. The tighter your playbook, the more repeatable your process, the higher your multiple. So if you're a CEO out there in particular, and or a founder and you are thinking about jake i get it tactically i am telling you right now the companies that set, that get invested in at the 50x top line the 60x top line are typically especially later on simply once you get to like series a b c d like that kind of tranche um it makes a big difference so if you don't have a playbook hopefully i have you know given you some insights into the the details around it um uh, a couple actually here sorry we've got a couple more slides in here that are actually pretty badass um again what does this tell your investors so as i kind of come back it's like one it, you don't have to go back and do all these exercises you've already you already have defined for your sales team who you sell to you've already defined the competitive landscape you've already established your benchmarks right you've established your real tam not your fake tam i call it your fake tam that's when you go tell investors that you've got um, we, our market's over 125,000 companies. No, it's not, dude. It's like 17,000 right now based on where your product is. So again, this is where a lot of your investors are, are wanting to go. So again, for us, I love this, 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 if you want to screenshot something today, I would screenshot this. And this is the same for your sales, you know, we'll call it, um, your sales, uh, uh, tech stack is, and, and by the way, this is less of a straight line than it is a loop which is we're experimenting with things. From those experiments, we spit out best practices and document them. We then deploy them. Then we start experimenting with new things. We document those best practices. We deploy them. Then we start experimenting with things. This is what a world-class process looks like. Never stops, right? Maybe it's every quarter, every, you know, every biannually, et cetera. All right, here we go. Another question here, take this. Uh, Brian says he's been screen, sh screen shooting all the way along. So, Hey, that's great. Appreciate that. So again, if you want to start to think about how to build this out, just a couple of things, again, look at the best practices. Um, the other thing, if you're like, Hey, Jake, I don't know how to run a discovery process. I think you all know what I'm about to go do right now. I'm going to go to Google and then I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to Google <laughs> trends. I'm going to Google best discovery questions for B2B sales in 2022, probably find 19 articles, 
right? So again, as a lot of this, just again, there's a lot of different ways to deploy. You could use Continue, you could use Seismic, you can use a lot of different companies. You know, again, a lot of this is just starting to write things down, consolidating it, and then organizing it. And this is, you know, even if you've got a lean team, this is just such a good way to do it. You know, interview the top performers, interview the founders, pull things out. We've got a big project with a team that's got 100 plus reps, and that's what we're doing. We're basically interviewing the top performers, we're finding the content, we're refreshing what they have, and then just organizing it uh, for them. So the other big part here is, and I think we've got a, um, a part here around deployment, which is again, don't think of the deployment as the end. Think of the deployment as the beginning, okay? Think about deployment as the beginning. A lot of things, I had a conversation actually with the same CRO I was mentioning earlier today. And as a part of this, you know, he was like, well, you know, what we probably need to do is like a series of trainings, et cetera. I'm like, no, you need a deployment plan for key elements and then a reinforcement plan. You know, developing a new piece of content and doing two or three trainings, it's never gonna stick ever. The, the sales, sales, I just want to pull, call this out. Sales is the only department that thinks when you introduce new concepts, now training can be great for reinforcing topics for people that are a 4.0 who need some tips or two or 2.0 trying to get to three or a one trying to get to two. Um, sales is the only department that thinks a one day training will solve a internal change issue. Well, we built a new discovery process. We'll just train them on it. No, that's not how we learn. I think it's like 85% of trainings are forgotten in the first like 45 days, it might be higher than that. So again, it's really important to think about a deployment plan as a part of this. And like I said, you know, that again has role plays, quizzes, coaching, you know, when you're actually deploying this, um, you know, again, iterate constantly, talk quite a bit, a bit about that and that there is no final version, you know, so for a lot of you out there, you know, don't, it's okay. It just is an ongoing piece. You're constantly making it better. And so that's why the sooner you lay the foundation, the faster you can get better, the faster you can benchmark, the faster you can update. Um, so, you know, look, there's a lot that goes into this. There's a lot that goes into world-class playbook. I've tried to walk through my hot take on it. Um, our team, I, th I think it's safe to say we've built high hundreds, if not thousands of playbooks. It probably is after nine years, it probably is thousands of playbooks. And, you know, what we walk through today is consistently, you know, why we see this being so critical for a CEO, for a sales rep. The other thing I'll, I'll say here is that if you are on the front lines or you are a VP of sales, you don't have to wait. All, again, you saw my process here about starting to document, taking notes, taking notes, document, 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 then start to formalize components of it over time. So we've got a couple of minutes left here for some Q&A as we go into it. Uh, and then we're going to wrap up. Yeah, probably in like a, a minute or so here. Um, Drew Williams, appreciate you. And Drew Williams, look here. He is a he is a sales playbook builder. So Drew, I really appreciate that and the, the shout out there. Uh, all right. So we've got our first question here. Uh, can you talk about formats for a playbook that have worked for you? Um, this is a fantastic question. So um, the question is around formats for playbooks. Okay. Uh, let me tell you what I've what we've also learned. And and I gotta tell you, there's nothing that makes me not maybe not nothing, but what the the one thing that makes me the most sick to my stomach as a, a person who leads a consulting firm is that when we build out this this beautiful playbook, and it just I can look and see that the last edits were, you know, eight months ago, right? It's in a Google Doc or something like that. Um, so here's what I would say. You want to, as much as humanly possible, have it be where people live or parts of it. So for example, there's an amazing partner of ours, new partner, shout out to the team at Speckit, um, S-P-E-K-I-T. Uh, Melanie and her team, Melanie's a CEO, she's amazing. And what it does is it's basically like a wiki. So like another option is Git Guru, Guru's another option. Um, but what it does is it, it, it can embed content on the actual web page. So if I'm in Salesforce, I'm like, oh, discovery, it could have best practices pop up around XYZ or here or there or wherever it is. Um, so that does a great job of bringing it to life. Uh, again, like there's a company called Continue with a U, C-O-N-T-I-N-U. And then there's Seismic is another one as well, too. Um, and then maybe like a third would be your, like, like a mind tickle. So building it out in some type of like learning management. To me, a really good playbook is a mix. Imagine when I'm getting onboarded, I've got this playbook to reference, 
And then I've got it built out in mind tickle. So then I can actually learn and reinforce as a part of it. And then I have this to reference, whether that's in articulate seismic, and I'm, I'm throwing a lot of different tech at you, but um, you know, spec it seismic, some of these others are some that we're, you know, we're really diving all in on. So we try to make it live where the people live as much as possible, whether that's in a wiki of some type um, embedded on the web page, even better um, or in the LMS, right. As well. So we'll drop in here. We've got some templates. Of course, we got some templates. Um, so we're going to drop in the chat here. Ricky just dropped those in so you guys can get some more examples of those. Um, all right. So two more questions here I'll take. One for Mr. Andrew Capel. Andrew, it says that we are, well, actually, I think it's because in its event, it says we're third degree connections. Andrew's amazing. Andrew's actually one of our consultants who builds playbooks. So this is it's a great question. Uh, what's the most creative value add touch point you've seen from sales playbooks recently? Uh, this is a, this is a really good one. Um, I and again, I'll steal it because we do it, but but I know Gong does it really well. Is um, teaching their sales team how to get active on LinkedIn. That you know, teaching your team how to communicate in public channels with customers, not just in DMs, etc. When how should you comment? What are things you should? And it's not about being um, taking over their LinkedIn. It's not that at all. It's teaching them, hey, like how can you interact with your buyers? So I like that one in particular. Um, all right, so uh, all right, so someone, all right, we use uh, ours on a wiki, so that's great too. Um, all right, so that's it, Andrew. That's my favorite one so far is making sure that you're, you know, teaching people about how to, how to team how to act in uh, digital channels. Um, okay, so I'll take. I'm going to take these two questions and in, in conjunction here. Eric asked a question: What's the ugliest playbook you've ever seen? Um, it's probably no playbook is the ugliest I've ever seen, which I've seen that a lot. I see that probably a few times a month. Um, uh, and what's the, um, the simple scales, complex fails. How true do you think this is? Um, I'll take both of these at the same time. So, uh, the ugliest playbooks that I see are playbooks that are super, super focused on qualification criteria and the sales process and don't have real world examples. Salespeople and any, any of us, just, just show me what it looks like. What's the script? What's the messaging? Let me listen to a recorded call. I think I, the, the version one I see of, of certain types of playbooks very much is like, here's our process. Here's the qualification. Not like, here's the practical examples. Here's what this means. You, know, you can tell me about this, but show me it in an application. Be realistic with me. So Eric, the ugliest playbooks are overly focused on process and not enough on how to show up and execute those pro that process, the messaging I should use, the scripting I should use, the trends, et cetera. So that equals ugly to me or areas for improvement, as we say now, uh, as a part of this. So, all right. So last one here is Eli, simple scales, complex fails, how true. Uh, I, I think it's very, very true. On the flip side, another ugly playbook is something that's over-engineered where people are like, ah, my eyes glazed over looking at this table of contents. I don't even know where to go. I'm out. I'm just going to go do my own thing. So I think it's a lot of this is the way that you deploy it. So you can have a playbook that's super, super robust, but it's about breaking it into like four sections and they could have six things within each section. So I think you have to think about how people learn and how people consume information that, you know, and, and where should that information best live to be easy for people to access in those times when they might go to look to access it. So, you know, for anyone out there, it's, it's thinking about, like I said before, well, maybe this part should live in the LMS. And then maybe this part should be reinforced with some type of, you know, content management system, um, et cetera. So, you know, for a lot of you out there, like don't overthink your first version of the playbook. Just think about the key customer points that you interact and make sure you have enablement material around that. And if you do that, you're going to be ahead of a lot of folks. So again, go ahead, check the link here. This uh, scaling with a K, always clever, Ricky, uh, zero to 20 million. Go check that out. Um, that's a big piece of content. We actually put a version of this out last year. We're going to be doing some massive upgrades to this. So whether you're a founder or a senior executive or someone on the front lines who's trying to think about the things that they need to do to scale, I, you know, I really highly, highly you know, suggest that you check it out. So thank you for tuning in. We had, I mean, gosh, we had probably a hundred something folks on LinkedIn Live, uh, another probably 30, 40 on Zoom. So it was a great session. Feel free um, if you'd like. If you're on the Zoom, that means you're on the email thread and you can literally, uh, we will email this out to all of you as well. 
If you're on LinkedIn, you can, one, as soon as I hit end here, you'll be able to go back and, and do this. You can tag in your teammates right now. You can just at mention them, they can come and see it. Or there's a little link up here. Like if you look at the top that you can actually copy and paste and send to your team in Slack or whatever. So that's what's up everyone. That's how you build a playbook. That's why it matters. Your company is not investing in playbooks right now. It is probably a big reason why you're struggling to scale at the rate that you would like to. I know it seems monotonous. I know it seems um, behind the scenes. You should be doing more. Um, yes, we will be sharing the deck as a part of this. Uh, and then Ricky, maybe we can, like for our folks in on LinkedIn, if you're on LinkedIn, I want you to do this. DM, he's up here, his name's Ricky Cookson. All right, the master of the memes. That's what we call him internally. This guy has crazy memes for days that he just sends out that are wonderful. Um, and yeah, DM Ricky here, where's his, uh, Ricky, toss your link to your LinkedIn at the bottom of the LinkedIn and we'll do that. So for the rest of you out there, thank you, appreciate you. Um, you have any questions, right? Um, do what I can do always um, and happy to help anyone as I can. Any other questions, shoot me a DM on LinkedIn and we'll see everybody. I don't know. I've got a bunch of webinars coming up. Stay tuned for the calendar. Appreciate everyone. We'll see you all next week.